and the bells continue not to ring. So uh, we are standing by waiting to see uh, if we get a more formal announcement here, Chris. Uh, Rick Leventhal just outside St. Peter's Square. You know, this is fascinating because uh, the, the smoke, it's so interesting because we have been told that uh, we were going to expect it to be either bright black or bright white, uh, but we we don't know. Uh, the, the fact is that it does not look unlike the so-called black smoke we saw at noon today. The one real telltale sign was the fact that it came so early, that it came uh, at a, before uh, 6 o'clock here. The uh, second session, the afternoon session, was supposed to end at 7 o'clock. Uh, and uh, th we thought that that's when, if there was smoke indicating no pope, that it would come at around 7 o'clock. Uh, the fact that it came now in the middle of the session would seem to indicate they've elected a pope. But again, no bells. And we were told, promised by the chief spokesman for the Vatican, that there uh, would be bells sounding to make it absolutely clear, even to journalists, he said with a smile, uh, that the... Uh, that there had been the election of a pope, and it is clear, not clear to this journalist. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I know that Italian TV is saying it, but for an excess of ca caution, I'm, uh, I'm holding fire here, guys. I don't know about you. Yeah, they were a little better yesterday with the black smoke at any rate, although yesterday was also confusing uh, at the beginning, but then it did get quite black. This has never really gotten very seriously black, but of course, uh, all this, all this talk about the bells, we thought it was going to help us. At this point, it's, it's given more, it's added more confusion to the whole thing as we wait to hear the bells. And now it's the top of the hour when the bells are supposed to ring anyway. So we'll. Uh, so we know that at that point the crowd is going to go nuts. <laughs> well, we, they this. just might. They just might. You, you have to say that if it isn't the election of a new pope, it's one of the great added climaxes. See now you can hear everyone shouting. But it's the top of the hour. We don't know if they're ringing is because it's six o'clock here or because it's it's a pope. If they keep ringing, we'll know it's the pope, correct? That's I the guess yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Have to ring lots okay. of bells this is instead why of just stopped. tolling they're the hearing, hour. They're hearing the bells. Now the we're hearing that the big bell facade of St. Peter's is not moving. Again, you know, this was a new system, and we never knew because of the fact that the conclave is cut off from the rest of the world. One of the questions a lot of us had asked was, how quickly would Vatican officials be alerted that they had elected a new pope? Uh, and therefore, how uh, soon would they begin ringing the bells? It's possible there is a disconnect between the burning of the ballots and the ringing of the bells. So uh, why don't we just listen to the sights and soak in uh, Listen to the uh, sounds and soak in the sights of St. Peter's Square because it's tremendous excitement there. They certainly believe they have a new pub. say uh, a lot of excitement and some confusion uh, across Rome and across St. Peter's Square because uh, we have smoke appeared billowing smoke from the chimney uh, but no indication yet the official confirmation that we thought we would get with the tolling of the bells that there was in fact a new pope. I got to tell you Greg Burke and Father Zulsdorf let me bring you in. I don't have a clue. <laughs> I don't have a clue. My suspicion is that we're, we, we, this is in fact white and we're on our way, although I'd feel a lot safer with the bells. Uh, and we're going to obviously have to wait 40 minutes until somebody comes out under that red bunting uh, if in fact it is all white. I don't have a clue. I have a hunch uh, that this is white and we're on. But uh, as obviously all the crowd there does as well. If not, it's, it's a really cruel joke and we're all back at this again tomorrow playing the games, but it's, it's, it's somewhat funny to tell you the truth because they talked about uh, the chemicals and how that was going to help and now also, you know, it wasn't going to be like the last time and they added a new stove and one thing or another and yesterday when it was black, it really was black. Uh, so that was good. Yesterday worked well. Again, let's take in the sights and sounds in St. Peter's Square for a moment. Leventhal has worked his 
his way uh, further into St. Peter's Square. Rick, uh, what can you tell us? Well, Chris, we're, we're in the middle of the crowd here in St. Peter's Square. Everyone is, as you can hear, cheering. And uh, I found some, uh, some police from the United States. You guys, are you guys convinced that we have a new There it is. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Don't start yeah. Right. yeah we can see the bell now, Chris. There it goes. Peter's are winning. We have a call. We got us a call. Well, this is a truly electric moment. It means... We need to pause for one moment to let our Fox stations join us for this breaking news story. We want to welcome our uh, Fox stations across the United States. This is Fox News breaking coverage of the selection of the new pope of the Roman Catholic Church. I'm Chris Wallace in Rome. What you just saw were the bells of St. Peter's tolling. What you're looking at are the excited faces of people in St. Peter's Square. The 115 cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church have chosen the 265th pope in the history of the church. This, for the first time, the bells tolling on the facade of St. Peter's. The Cardinals in the Sistine Chapel, we believe, uh, in the fourth vote. The uh, first vote in the afternoon session of the second day have chosen their Pope. And you can hear from our rooftop, hear the bells beginning to toll across Vatican City and across the city of Rome as the city celebrates a new leader for the Roman Catholic Church.
know, you hear the expression sheer joy. This is sheer joy. The, the sounds, the sights, the, 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 the sheer expression of joy on the faces of the, the pilgrims in St. Peter's. And it is almost as if the sadness of the long goodbye to the great Pope who preceded John Paul, that all of that is broken, and now the people of Rome and the pilgrims who are here are just giving vent to the sheer sense of joy in the excitement of a new Pope and the continuity of the Catholic Church. We should just briefly tell you what's going on right now. The Pope has been elected. He got a two-thirds majority in the College of Cardinals. That means he got at least 77 votes. Uh, he was then asked if he would accept the position of Pope, uh, and he says he accepts it. He then goes into a back room, uh, and because they did not who the, know who the Pope was, he is changing into the papal vestments, into the white robes. And because they did not know who the Pope was, and obviously his size, a family tailor here, Gamera, made three papal vestments, small, medium, and large, and they'll find the one that fits them the best. Then each of the cardinals will come up to him and swear allegiance to him, correct, Father Zulsdorf? That's correct. What they do is they come up and very solemnly uh, profess their obedience to him, that they will obey uh, him as the new sovereign pontiff of the Roman Catholic Church. And then after that, probably about half an hour to 45 minutes from now, the on the front balcony, on the second level of the facade of St. Peter's, the great doors will open to that balcony. The senior deacon cardinal, called the Cardinal Proto-Deacon, uh, Jorge Arturo Medina Estevez of Chile, a 78-year-old, he will come out and he will announce to the world in Latin, and, and bear with me here, folks, he will say, Anuntio vobis gaudium magnum, I announce to you great joy, and then the great words, which you're seeing translated in English, habemus papa, we have a pope. Uh, he will then say his name, his, his, the name that he has held up till now, and then also announce what his new name will be, the name that he has chosen. Uh, and then he will walk out into uh, the spotlight, into the public view, and for the first time, we'll get a sense of who this pope is, and then begin to chew over at great length who he is and what his choice means for the future of the church, Greg. And his very first words, obviously, that's going to be very interesting. The, the only thing he really has to do is give the blessing on his first time out, but it'll be interesting. Carl Wojty, when he came out, he took advantage to talk about how he came from afar uh, and opened the doors to Christ and Italian being our language, really winning over the Romans right away. Uh, you were talking about the Sistine Chapel and how the Pope goes off to get uh, dressed immediately after that as Pope into white rather than the Cardinal's red. Uh, one of the rooms off the Sistine Chapel they call the Room of Tears, and I don't know, uh, perhaps Father Zulsdorf knows about that, I believe it's known as that, uh, in case it's your last chance. If you have any crying to do, this is when to get it out, right? Well, they say that it could be either tears of joy or maybe tears of fear and sorrow because you've had this great responsibility laid upon your shoulders. take a break here uh, so some of our uh, Fox stations can break away. Uh, others may continue with the coverage and of course we'll continue uh, on the Fox News Channel. For more on this developing story, keep it here on this Fox station and Fox News Channel on cable and satellite. I'm Chris Wallace in Rome. Wallace back in Rome uh, on the Fox News Channel and I'm sure some Fox stations around the country. Uh, the words at the bottom of your screen say it all. We have a Pope. Uh, really, I think uh, we'd all agree surprisingly quickly uh, on the fourth vote on the second day, uh, the 115 cardinal electors of the Roman Catholic Church have voted by a two-thirds majority to elect a new Pope. And as long as we're speculating, uh, the fact that it is so quickly, uh, Father Zulsdorf would, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say it first, tend to make me think it's one of the front runners. Well, the one would think so, because uh, if the front runner hadn't uh, been able to get to a majority rather quickly, then you would think they'd start maybe a little bit of horse trading, right? Maybe the front runner would say, well, I'll, I'll throw my support behind this candidate or that candidate, and then they would begin expanding the pool a little bit. But the fact that we have an election that's so quick, one of the fastest
fastest elections in the last century, it lead, leads us to believe that perhaps it will be it will be one of the, the famous ones, the guys that's been in the press the most often these days. Chris, I have to agree. I've uh, been wrong a lot in the past 24 hours, I have to admit, but I've got my book open to Cardinal Ratzinger because uh, I think he has been one of the names mentioned, and I think the outpouring of affection for John Paul II, too, certainly did, to a certain degree, put him in the lead. Now, uh, I'm not going to go too far with that because... Uh, Obviously, we don't know at this point, but uh, it would it would lead to would lead us to think that a frontrunner had taken it. And among the frontrunners, in addition to Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, the. Uh the cardinal, one of the Pope John Paul's top advisors, the dean of the College of Cardinals, who really has occupied center stage since the Pope died, presided at his funeral, presided at the uh, at the mass yesterday before the election of the Pope. In addition to him, uh, one could think of uh, Cardinal Tetamanzi of Milan, uh, Cardinal Schönborn of uh, of Austria. I suppose if it's a third worlder, uh, Arinze of Nigeria would be a possibility, Maradiaga of Honduras. But I mean, I think we're talking about a fairly small circle of perhaps a half dozen uh, who it's likely to be. Watch us all be surprised, but you, you certainly think in terms of them first. Yeah, it, especially this coming so quickly. I think if it were long and drawn out, we could, we could expect anything. I was saying earlier that you could make a list. At this, in this conclave, you could make a list of 20 people and still not have it. However, the fact that this happened so early uh, is obviously an indication that they did not need too, too much time to make the, make up their minds. Yesterday it was interesting, obviously, that they even took an, uh, they took a vote yesterday, whereas in the past two conclaves we knew that on the first day they did not take one. They did not have to yesterday, but they did. And obviously they, they got down to work. Not only did they get down to the work, they got it they got it done with in 24 hours. Now, again, let's just recap the situation, and we can talk about what we believe is going on right now. Uh, the, the Cardinals have elected a pope in the Sistine Chapel, at least 77 votes, a supermajority of two-thirds. Uh, and at that point, uh, the cardinal who was elected pope was asked if he would accept the job, which when one thinks about it is a, a big question. Uh, and whoever it was uh, says, uh, accepto, is that correct? That's, I accept. That's right. He says that I accept. Not only that, um, at this point, at the very moment, at the very moment that he says, I accept, then at that point he has full and universal power within the Catholic Church. At that point, he is the Pope. And uh, it's uh, before he puts on all of his gear and before he even accepts all of the obediences of the Cardinals. And then, uh, as we mentioned, uh, he goes into a back room and he is given the papal vestments. Uh, as I said, they come in three sizes, small, medium, and large. He'll choose whichever fit him the best. Uh, and then uh, he accepts uh, the support, the loyalty, the pledge of support from each of the other 114 Cardinals. Do we know how that's done? Do they each approach him one by one? Well, thank you for the promotion to Cardinal. Oh, I'm Chris. sorry, Father's up. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a it's a good day. Yeah, that's great. It's uh, it's one, certainly wonderful for the church. What will happen is that uh, the Holy Father will come out and he'll sit down in a, in a chair, what is called his cathedra. It's an official chair uh, that's a symbol of his authority to teach and to and to render judgments. And then they will come up one by one and kneel down before him, and they will swear their their obedience to him. And uh, they'll have, this will have to be repeated 114 times, of course, so it's going to take a little while. But there's another thing that they do, too. They will have a reading of the gospel before they go out, and they will also sing a long hymn of praise to God called the Te Deum. And this is, a, this is a very, very beautiful hymn, and it takes a while to sing. It'll all be in Gregorian chant. And they will uh, then wrap it up and then process up here. Yes, and, and we just want to point out that what you're seeing on the right there, uh, the right part of your screen, is the central balcony and the front, middle, second floor of the facade of St. Peter's. And in a little while, probably in the next half hour, those doors will open. The Cardinal Deacon will come out, Senior Cardinal Deacon. He will announce Habemus Popham and introduce the Pope to his flock and to the world. Rick Leventhal is down in St. Peter's Square with some Americans, excited Americans, I suspect. Rick, take yes. it away. Chris, well, we've been, we've been just waves of energy, waves of excitement here since that smoke first appeared, and we have found uh, several Americans in the crowd. So you're from Charlotte, is that right, North Carolina? North Carolina, yes. How has this been for you to be here at this time? 
unbelievable. Yeah. Absolutely unbelievable. It's, I can't tell you. It's, it's inside. Chills? Chills, shivers, everything. Terrific. We got a whole crowd of women from Michigan here. Ladies, uh, you're, you were hoping that you'd be here for this, right? Yes, we're very, very excited. Are you surprised it happened so quickly? We're shocked, absolutely shocked. We're, we're so excited to be here in such a pivotal moment in history. What, uh, what did you think when you first saw the smoke? Could you tell that it was white? Yes, yeah. you definitely oh, yeah. could tell it was white. We were shocked. We, we, we ran over here with the expectation of seeing black smoke and saying that was great we were here for that, but right. never thought it would happen. Did you hear that there were supposed to be bells ringing also? Yes. And you, yes. Were you confused? Because it took a few minutes, yes. Uh -huh. We yeah. talked, we said, where are the bells? It looks white, where are the bells? Yeah. Chris, what we saw was, were waves, waves after waves of people just flowing into the square and, and ripples going through the crowd, cheers and applause, and then people waiting because they weren't sure if, in fact, we had a pope because of the because of the uh, the lack of bells. Do you have uh, a feeling about what this means to have a vote so quickly? They're united. <laughs> They're united. It's a strong and, decision. And are you excited about uh, what this might mean for the future of the church? It's very excited. We're, we're hoping that he has the. Uh, charisma and the ability to reach out like uh, Pope John Paul II has um, up to this time and that he uh, just continues on and, and just continues to do great things. I'm guessing none of you are going anywhere for the time being. Is that a safe assumption? Wait. <laughs> I think, uh, I think, Chris, that we are going to be in a standing room only situation here very quickly. We have a little room to move right now, but uh, it's pretty packed. There's a press area in the center here. Beyond that, uh, huge crowds that have been uh, right in front of St. Peter's Basilica for much of the day. Uh, again, the, the smoke first appeared uh, about an hour and 10 minutes before we thought it would, and that's what generated so much excitement so early. And then, of course, even though the last two times smoke has come out, it's been white at the start, it turned to black. This time it stayed white, and that's when word started to spread that we did, in fact, uh, have a pope. Uh, I think I did. Ma'am, do you speak English? You speak English. No? How, how do you feel about today's events? Sir? Well, I'm very excited, in fact. Now we're just waiting for the name. Do you, do you have a, 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 a hope, a, a dream for who this next pontiff might be? I have no idea, but what I know is going to be a very good pope. Why do you think that, sir? Well, what I don't go by is uh, this question of he has to fit in the shoes of the, the other pop, I think is not realistic. What we need is a good pop. Yeah. Yeah. So are you, uh, what does it mean to you to be here at this time, on this day? Oh, it's historical. I'm very excited because pops are not elected every other day. Yeah. yeah. Well, so it's very unique. 26 years. It's unique. One of the happiest times of my life. <laughs> Terrific. Well, we're glad we could share it with you. I, I, I talked to some priests uh, a short time ago, Chris, who were gathering here. They were confirming for me that it was, in fact, white smoke. They were convinced that we had a pope, and they were so excited because they, they talked about what this meant for the church, how, how the, the cardinals inside were obviously united uh, after four bouts to come up with a, a new leader, a 265th leader of the Catholic Church. And again, uh, it's uh, a lot of anticipation right now as to who the next pope is. Chris? Rick, thanks so much. And I, I think that was a very interesting point that one of the people you talked to uh, made, exactly that, that uh, it did happen quickly. And for all the talk of all the commentators uh, speculating over the course of the last few weeks about all the divisions in the church between tradition and reform, uh, with Europe and the third world, young and old, a long papacy or a short papacy, it seems that there were very few divisions among the 115 cardinal electors that uh, they, with remarkable speed, came to a conclusion about where the church needs to be headed and who needs to head it. Uh, uh, Father Zulsdorf, I think that's really an important message they were sending. It was a very good message. As a matter of fact, I think the lady that was being interviewed got it in one. That one of the things that this told to her in the square is that the cardinals had unity together. And so this rapid election, if it was meant by the cardinals to show to the church, yes, we are not divided amongst ourselves. We know what we're doing. We know the direction. This is the man we think is going to take us into the future. Then the woman out there got in and won, and the cardinals made a strong message. We have unity.
No, and I think we all agree. We had begun to talk about the fact that if this dragged on to a third day or a fourth day, that would also send a message of, if not deadlock, certainly division. They have sent precisely the opposite message today. Yes, Greg? Yeah. Oh, definitely. And I find it fascinating because two-thirds is two-thirds. I mean, uh, that is not easy to come by straight off. And this is what looks to us like probably four votes, you know, one yesterday and three today from the things happened. That, so that is quite... Uh, quite quick, and especially if you're looking for not a simple majority, but for two thirds. Obviously, uh, they moved very quickly on this, and there's quite a bit, quite a bit of agreement. And I find it fascinating because I, I would think the Cardinals are probably a little bit uh, unsure among themselves. Did they want a young pope or an old pope, regardless of where he comes from? You know, did, did we want somebody for more of a transition, or did we want somebody young? who can uh, take on the challenges the church has. So we'll find out very soon what they were thinking in terms of age. And again, to put this in historical perspective, there were eight elections of popes in the 20th century. The shortest, the quickest election was Pius XII in 1939, two days, three ballots. Uh, the second shortest was 1978 John Paul I, two days, four ballots. Well, we believe, we don't know for sure, but we believe that this ties John Paul I as the second quickest election in the last hundred years, two days and four ballots. I mean, this really is fast, isn't it, Father Zilsdorf? Well, when we, uh, when we saw the, the cardinals go into the Sistine Chapel and they began to make their solemn oaths to obey all of the rules of the conclave, I mean, we could all see that these men had their game faces on. They were really interested in getting down to work. They were very serious. They were very solemn. And they had had a series of meetings, remember, in the week before the conclave began. So they had been discussing issues. They had heard meditations. They had talked about what the issues were in the church. And they already had, shall we say, their minds around some of the most important uh, points of discussion and even possible division between them. They had their minds around those things. But once they were there in that amazing place and the doors closed and they began to get down to business, you could see that, uh, well, certainly the workings of the Holy Spirit, they were open to these things. Of course, we understand that the Holy Spirit is prompting the Cardinals, but these men truly got down to work and they gave us a strong message of unity. You know, the other point I think it's important to make, originally there was this two-week delay between uh, the, the death of a pope and the beginning of the conclave because it took some considerable period of time for uh, the cardinals from around the world to get there. In fact, there's some famous stories of American cardinals taking a steamship across the Atlantic, arriving in Europe and finding that the pope had been elected without them. Uh, obviously, with the, the miracles of modern travel today, almost all these cardinals have been in Rome for the better part of two weeks. So it wasn't as if they were saying hello as they arrived at the conclave. They, were, they had been here, and one has to think there had been conversations going on over the last two weeks. Definitely, yeah. There's no doubt about that. I had spoken with... Uh, uh, one of the cardinals who wasn't voting, so he was over 80, but actually he just told me a couple days ago, he said, well, let's hope it's over uh, by Tuesday night or Wednesday morning. And I thought he was being overly optimistic, but obviously he knew he knew the score, and he had been in on the earlier meetings, so uh, obviously had some inkling of the way things were going and, and nailed it. And again, uh, because of the speed with which uh, the new pope has been elected, uh, we don't know who it is, but I think we would all agree it's going to be a familiar face. It's going to be someone who, as he comes out on that balcony, we will instantly recognize him as one of the leading cardinals in the church, whether it is uh, Ratzinger uh, or one of the Italians uh, like Tetamanzi, uh, Mara Diaga, uh, Arinze from Nigeria. That it'll be one of the, the half dozen or so leading candidates that we've all been talking about. Yes, uh, Chris. I think you're. I think you're, you're. You're thinking right along the right lines. But you know, when we think now back to that homily of Cardinal Ratzinger, that incredible 18-minute tour de force that he gave, one begins to wonder now. Well, was he? Was that an exhortation to the cardinals, or was he beginning to inform, gently inform the church throughout the world along the lines of maybe the cardinals were thinking about that maybe there was some unity with together as they were going into the conclave, and he was beginning to lay the foundation for uh, what we were going to find here, the gentleman we were going to see here on the balcony in a few minutes. Uh, let's switch down to uh, Greg Palcott. Uh, he's uh, down the street from St. Peter's Square, but I'm sure he's got plenty of crowd with him right there. Greg? 
Absolutely amazing, Chris. Absolutely amazing. We are at the end of Via della Consolazione. That's the main boulevard that leads back from St. Peter's Square. We're about four blocks away, and it seems like all of Rome is running towards St. Peter's Square. I have seen hundreds and hundreds and no, hundreds. No, no, no. We're not speculating about who it is. The they're going across the, going across the boulevard, uh, defying the cars. I think the police were, in fact, not ready for this at all. There is no protection for the people. And, in fact, a lot of people are even bringing their children in strollers right across seven lanes of traffic. Chris, we have stood here and watched the very solemn procession of pilgrims coming to view the body of Pope John Paul II. This is a whole different feeling now. This is the feeling of uh, people. People looking at the new chapter of the Roman Catholic Church beginning, and they're all filling, filling the boulevard that's uh, leading up to St. Peter's Square, which is already filled up. St. Peter's Square itself can hold 50,000. When these boulevards, when these streets that lead away from St. Peter's Square are also filled with people, we're talking about 100,000. We're talking about 150,000. Everybody here wants to be a part of history. It's as if the word got out to the city of several million that they had to come here and we're not seeing people just from uh, just from all over the world but citizens here leaving their homes leaving their businesses coming down here to be a part of history and, and I'm telling you they're risking their life and their limb this is very very important to them and we're seeing a bit of history too from our vantage point Chris Thanks so much, Greg Palcott. And uh, I have to say that, you know, these pictures of people swarming, and you know that the word must have gotten out very quickly. Of course, there were bells ringing across Rome, so that's a pretty good way to get word. But uh, you have the sense that uh, if all roads lead to Rome at this moment, all roads in Rome lead to St. Peter's Square. Uh, again, to point out, you have uh, on the right there the, uh, the main balcony over St. Peter's Square in the center of the facade on the second floor. And some point in the next period of moments, those uh, huge doors will open off the uh, Hall of Blessings. Uh, and it's amazing to think it was just yesterday that uh, the cardinals all gathered in the Hall of Blessings and began their procession into the Sistine Chapel to begin uh, this whole process. And now, gosh, just a, a little bit over, I'd say, 26 hours later, uh, the Pope is coming back into the Hall of Blessings. He'll step out onto the balcony. He will be introduced by the senior deacon cardinal, the official title Cardinal Proto-Deacon, Cardinal Jorge Arturo Medina Estevez of Chile, a 78-year-old. Uh, Father Zulsdorf, do you know anything about uh, Cardinal Estevez? Well, Cardinal Estevez, he was, uh, for quite a while, he was the prefect of the Congregation for Divine Worship and Discipline of the Sacraments, which was an extremely important Vatican position because it, it dealt with governance, it dealt with governance of all the ways in which the Church officially worships God. And uh, in that role, of course, uh, he made some you know, very important decisions and uh, uh, some controversial decisions. But his main role at this point is to uh, introduce the new pope to the world. And again, he will do that. He will read in Latin, Anuntio vobis gaudium magnum, I announce to you great joy. And then the magic words, habemus papam, we have a pope. Chris, one of the interesting things you can hear from the crowd a little bit, people already saying, Viva il Papa, screaming Viva il Papa. They don't know who he is yet, but they're saying, long live the Pope, long live the Pope. You can just feel that people are ready to reach out with their hearts to the man who's going to appear there on the balcony. They're just ready to embrace him. Literally running down the street now, too, as well, to get to the square, which is already full, so they're filling up outside into the outside square, too, known as the Pius XII. And again, with the speed with which the 115 cardinals elected him, or the 114 elected the 115, you have a sense that they're all reaching out to embrace this new pope as well. That uh, remarkable unity, whatever the message is, and we'll get a sense of that message when we see the face of the new pope. This is where the cardinals, the princes of the church, want this church to go, correct? Chris, you know, it's interesting. As a, as a priest, I say Mass every day. And in the main section of Mass, there's a point at which you say the Pope's name. Well, for a while now, we haven't had a Pope. And so there's been this enormous Pope-sized hole right in the <laughs> middle of the Mass. And now, finally, as a priest, I'll have the, you know, the pleasure of being able to say the name of the new Pope there. Chris, what I find interesting about the election that happened so quickly was that 
it happened so quickly after such a long pontificate. You think that after such a long pontificate, well, they'd want some time to sort of reassess things, one thing or another, you know, and, and a long and very strong pontificate as well, very marked by a strong personality. So I find it fascinating that this happened so quickly, and as I say, so quickly when they still had to have a two-thirds majority. Now, Father Zulsdorf, you had the, the, the great good fortune of uh, actually spending some time with Pope John Paul. And one of the thoughts that I'm having, the human stories that I'm thinking about it during this period between the election and as we wait for him to uh, step out onto that balcony, is the extraordinary transition that this man is going through from being a cardinal, which is obviously a position of great responsibility, but from that to being the leader of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, from your experience with John Paul, is it a title, is it a position that a man can wear lightly, or is it just an awesome responsibility that uh, is a burden to any pope? Well, the Holy Father himself uh, gave some advice to the man we're going to see step out here on the balcony in a little while. In the Constitution, in which he laid out all of the rules for the conclave, at the very end of it, he says, and to the one whom they elect, I ask you, do not refuse the great weight of this offer, of this office if it is offered to you. Do not refuse, because God will help you to bear the weight. Clearly, this is something that the Holy Father, uh, sorry, the, the late Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, that he felt keenly, and he talked about it in his will, as a matter of fact, and he wrote poetry about it, the very difficult dimensions of his office. So he told his successor, do accept it. Take the burden on your shoulders. God will give you the strength to carry it. But but he did say the great weight. In other oh, words, certainly. That whoever this, uh, this cardinal is, who is now, well, as you say, he's officially already the pope, but we haven't seen him yet come out. Uh, then you just imagine the thoughts racing through his mind, and I suspect, as you, as you mentioned, he's uh, praying to the Lord for some help. It's not for nothing that the little room and the very edge of the Sistine Chapel, where he puts on his white cassock for the first time, and he puts the white skull cap on his head for the first time, is it's no accident that that room is called the Room of Tears. But that, that's where you have to stop shedding the tears and... Uh, Accept the the vestments and the responsibility, as you say, or as Pope John Paul said, the great weight of this job. I think, Chris, picking up on that, you're right, you're exactly right. There's no uh, comparison. I, a cardinal is a prince of the church, obviously a very important position. Some of these men are very, very powerful in their own right, whether they be head of a big archdiocese or whether they have a big job in Rome. But the difference between that, uh, some of those guys take the bus and you see them around the streets, you see these people walking around the neighborhood right behind us right here. But the difference between that and being the shepherd of one billion souls is enormous. It's, uh, you can't compare it one to the other. No, in a sense, his life will never be his own again. And it's so interesting because we all have become students uh, of the various cardinals in preparing for this, and you, you mentioned Ber Bergoglio of uh, Argentina does take the bus to work every day. Bergoglio, who takes the bus, others, I was mentioning a young Frenchman who likes to go out for a run every morning, you know. If he were elected, I guess he'd be running in the Vatican Gardens. But, you know, uh, the Pope who liked to go out and ski and hike and still was able to do that to a certain degree, but to a large degree was made a prisoner of the Vatican, you know. He, could, he just couldn't pick up and do that as he would have in the old days. One of the one of the uh, readings from the gospel that they have an option to read after the election of the Pope and before they even come up to the balcony, one of the readings talks about how Christ and Peter are talking by the Sea of Galilee. And he says, and Christ says to Peter, that one day when you are older, they will bind your hands and take you to where you do not want to go. And this is one of the dimensions of the, what we call, the technical term is the Petrine ministry, the minister, the ministry of Peter. Now remember, this man who is about to step out into the balcony is the successor of Peter, the same apostle uh, over whose bones that mighty basilica was built. When he steps out into that balcony, we will see the successor of Peter, the one to whom Christ himself gave the keys, his own authority to bind and loose in heaven and in earth. Again, you're looking at uh, pictures of St. Peter on the left, uh, the, the, the wide shot uh, of St. Peter's uh, on the right, the balcony on which the new pope shortly will come forward.
We need to pause for one moment to let our Fox stations join us for this breaking news story. This is Fox News coverage of the selection, uh, in fact, now the announcement of uh, the next pope. I'm Chris Wallace in Rome. Uh, just to set the scene for those of you who are just joining us, a new pope has been elected. That we know. The world knows it. St. Peter's Square there on the left of your uh, television screen filling up with tens of thousands, perhaps uh, 100,000 people. You can hear the horns honking in uh, Vatican City. Uh, and as all roads lead into uh, St. Peter's Square uh, and people waiting for their new pope, uh, on the right you can see a balcony. That balcony is on the, the center of the facade, the front of uh, St. Peter's Square, uh, and on the second floor. And in a matter of moments, uh, those grand doors will open. The uh, senior deacon cardinal, uh, a cardinal from Chile, a 78-year-old, will appear on the, on the balcony and announce in Latin, Habemus Papam, we have a pope. Uh, and then this new pope, who was elected uh, uh, some period of time, gentlemen, do we, we don't know exactly when the first oh, pope started. before the top of the hour. That's right, it was close to an hour ago, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, the, the new pope, who has been pope for an hour, will, uh, the doors will open and he will come out. We will find out who he is. We will find out uh, what name he has chosen since the uh, 6th century A.D. Uh, all popes uh, have changed their names and chosen uh, another name. Uh, for instance, Karol Wojtyła of Poland became Pope John Paul II. And that name itself, uh, there's an old Roman proverb, uh, the name is the sign. It will send a message. If it's, uh, for instance, if it should be John Paul III, it obviously would send a message of great continuity uh, with the previous pope. Other names uh, send other messages. And then he will deliver a blessing uh, called Urbi et Orbi, uh, a blessing to the city of Rome, of which he will be the bishop, and of course to the world. Uh, let me bring in Greg Burke and Father John Zulsdorf, who are here with me, waiting for the moment you hear the, the cheers coming up. You're starting to see the doors open right now. We're going to have the ushers coming out, opening the doors. The cheers are just out of control here. They're out of control in the square, so it's just going to be a matter of seconds now before we get the announcement. It's only the ushers. You see no churchmen right now. They're actually just open the doors and the drapes have closed again, but it should be any time now. Any time. Again, the first uh, member of the church that we see will be the cardinal announcing. This is it. This is Estevis, and he will announce the new pope. Fratelli e sorelle carissimi, my dearest brothers and sisters, queridísimos hermanos y hermanas, my dearest brothers and sisters, bien chers frères et sœurs, my dearest brothers and sisters. Liebe Brüder und Schwestern, my dearest brothers and sisters, dear brothers and sisters, Annuncio Vobis Gaudium Magnum. I announce to you a great joy. Abemus Papam. We have a Pope. Eminentissimum the most reverendissimum dominum and most reverend lord dominum josephum lord joseph sancte romane ecclesie of Cardinal the holy ratzinger roman catholic church cardinal ratzinger Joseph Ratzinger.
qui sibi nomen in possuit who chooses for himself the name benedicti decimi sexti of benedict 16th Benedict the 16th main balcony we uh, await the new pope cardinal joseph ratzinger benedict the 16th coming out onto the balcony and delivering a blessing urbi et orbi to the city of rome and to the world You can hear the crowd already beginning to say is Benedict. Father Zul, Zulsdorf, tell me what's going on right now. Well, it looks like what they're going to do is hang over the edge of the balcony the papal coat of arms. It would certainly, we don't know what the coat of arms for Cardinal Ratzinger will be yet, but it may be one just for the symbol of the Holy See. It may be even the old, the old coat of arms of the former Pope, we don't know, because it would be a little, little quick to, to put that up. Now let me ask you, uh, Benedict, what's the, yeah, see, it's the, the, what's the significance of that name? Well, uh, Benedict, of course, Benedict, the word means blessed one, and so it refers to the blessings that God gives to us, and it's also a name that's been used 15 times before. Benedict the 16th is this pope. There was the last time there was a Benedict was after Pope uh, Pius X. That's right. He was elected Benedict the 15th in 1914. That's right. It was right on the verge of World War I, remember? Now, to the degree that we think that there's a significance to names, uh, does Benedict send any message? Well, Benedict the 15th had a bit more of a reputation as being a, a moderate pope uh, after maybe the more rigorous time of Pope Pius X. That's perhaps interesting. And Father Ratzinger wanting to send a more moderate image since he has much of a reputation as being very much a hardliner and did not choose Pius, for example, at Pius X. Well, certainly, uh, had, had Cardinal Ratzinger chosen the name Pius, that would have sent a very different message. And but we expect that the next uh, person we're going to see come through those crimson drapes and out onto the central balcony will be the new leader of the Roman Catholic Church. Probably what we're going to see first, Chris, is, is a, a processional cross. First, we'll see someone come through and he'll be holding high, very high cross, and there should be some cardinals with him. We, we, whether we see the... Well, of course, you know, the, the Holy Father, the Holy Father can choose to do this in any way he wish, but this is, this is going to be a, a, a traditional pope, you know. He will, he will certainly embrace a lot of the old traditions. And uh, so we're more than likely going to see the procession cross come out first. But when those drapes come open again, we're going to hear an absolute eruption. Now, as we wait, and let's stop as soon as we begin to see that procession, uh, Father Zulsdorf, Joseph Ratzinger, we can see here some of the Swiss Guard proceeding. We, we, we have well, both the Swiss Guard and the Carbonieri Band. Okay, we have an Italian band and the Swiss Guard as well. Jo Joseph Ratzinger, what has his position most recently been uh, in the Roman Church here in the Vatican? Well, Cardinal Ratzinger, the, the former Cardinal Ratzinger, now Benedict the Sixteenth, he had as a role. In the, uh, in the church to be the prefect of the congregation for the doctrine of the faith. And in that position for over 23 years, he has been, shall we say, overseeing that the teaching of the church all throughout the world has been uh, in keeping with the church's perennial teachings. Oh, that's, there that's just right and watch.
Cari fratelli e sorelle, Dear brothers and sisters. Dopo il grande Papa Giovanni Paolo II, after our great Pope John Paul II, I signori cardinali hanno eletto me un semplice umile lavoratore nella vigna del Signore. A simple humble worker in God's vineyard. Mi consola il fatto I'm consoled by che il Signore fact. sa lavorare e agire that the Lord knows how to work and how to act, even with insufficient tools. And I especially trust in your prayers. Nella gioia del Signore risorto, in the joy of the resurrected Lord, del suo aiuto permanente andiamo trust, avanti. Trustful Il ci of his permanent help, Maria, we go ahead, madre, that sure that God will help us, and Mary, parte. his most beloved mother, Grazie. stands on our side. Thank you. Viva il Papa, long live the Pope. Procediamo alla benedizione. Let us proceed with the blessing. Sancti Apostoli Petro et Paolo. Holy Apostles Peter and Paul. We trust in your power and in your authority. authority. Please bless, bless us through Lord Jesus our Lord. Amen. Through the prayers and interception of Our Lady, Blessed John Best, Baptist and all the Apostles, Peter and Paul, and all the saints, Omnipotent God, have mercy on us, and please remit all our sins with the blessing of Jesus Christ and lead us into the eternal life. Amen. Indulgentiam, absolutionem, may there be indulgence and absolution and the remission of all your sins. After being having repented duly, and may your life be blessed, and may you have the consolation of the grace of the Holy Spirit. 
and may through your perseverance and your good, good works the Lord in his omnipotence and in his mercy forgive you. Amen. And I bless through the Lord omnipotent in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May the blessing be upon you and always be with you. Amen. A shepherd and his flock. Benedict the 16th. Until an hour ago, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. And let's do a little business to explain exactly who this man is. He turned 78 years old on Saturday. Uh, he is the oldest pope to become a pope, the oldest pope to accede to the position in more than a century. Uh, he was the dean of the College of Cardinals. He was the man who uh, announced the, the death of John Paul. He uh, celebrated, he presided at his funeral, and he uh, celebrated the mass yesterday before the, for the election of a new pope, uh, the, uh, the mass in St. Peter's Basilica before all the cardinals went into the Sistine Chapel to begin this process. He was always the front runner, according to the Italian press. He was the man with uh, 40 to 50 of the 75, 77 votes he needed for a two-thirds majority. Uh, and the press account seemed to be right because he swept to a victory on the second day on the fourth ballot. Uh, it seems interesting because there were a lot of questions. Did they want uh, a young pope who could serve a long time or an older pope? They certainly chose an older pope. Did they want someone who followed in the footsteps of John Paul or perhaps to signal a change? They chose one of John Paul's closest advisors. There you see some of the, some of the cardinals who just helped elect this pope uh, on a balcony watching their new leader along with the rest of us. Chris, I think uh, actually probably no one was closer connected to John Paul II's papacy. If you take away the, the Pope's own private secretary, uh, he had brought Cardinal Ratzinger, Ratzinger there in 1981, put him in a key position, and made him stay till the end. Basically, uh, he wanted Cardinal Ratzinger right in there, and he was in on all of the most important decisions. To, to give you a sense of how senior a man he was, there were only two of the cardinals, two of the 115 who had been around long enough that they had actually been in a prior conclave, and he was one of the two. He was made a cardinal by Pope Paul VI in 1977, and he was one of the two who voted uh, in 1978 uh, for John Paul II. So he, he was one of the two who uh, knew his way around these events. And there you can see some of the cardinals, their work done, the new pope having been elected and looking out on that vast throng in St. Peter's Square.
we should also point out that uh, in the debate among traditionalists and reformists, Ratzinger comes down very strongly on the side of the traditionalists. He was the prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, one of the Vatican's most important jobs, and uh, it was his job to uh, basically enforce discipline and to uh, state the tenets of the church and make sure that everybody stood by them. Uh, for instance, uh, liberation theology popular in Latin America, and he uh, quieted, and this all uh, very much with the support and at the direction of John Paul, uh, quieted down the theologians who were trying to spread liberation theology in Latin America. In 1986, he issued a firm Vatican denunciation of homosexuality and gay marriage. Um, a 2004 document sternly denounced radical feminism as an ideology that undermined the family and obscured the natural differences between men and women. Uh, as recently, and this was another time when he took center stage, on Good Friday when the Pope was too ill uh, to carry the cross in the Colosseum as he had done for so many years, it was Cardinal Ratzinger, now Benedict XVI, who did so uh, and made a, a very strong speech at that time. He said, how much filth there is in the church, even among those who in the priesthood should belong entirely to him. How much pride, how much self-sufficiency. So uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, now Benedict XVI, uh, Father Zulsdorf, uh, very few doubts about where this man stands. Well, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, has, uh, as Cardinal, was a very uh, extensively published theologian. Now, he's had a very long career as a theologian and as a teacher. Uh, he was an expert at the Second Vatican Council. One of the things that we can see in the election of Benedict XVI is a continuity with the Second Vatican Council. He was even a friend of the young Bishop Carol Wojtyla during the Second Vatican Council. They knew each other. They've known each other for a very long time. Now, it's interesting that at the time of the council, uh, then uh, Joseph Ratzinger, Father Joseph Ratzinger's theology was considered to be really quite avant-garde. He was considered to be quite the liberal. And uh, many people, uh, the better theologians who read him, have uh, come to the conclusion that really Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, as a theologian, his theology didn't really change all that much. He didn't become a traditionalist. He didn't become a conservative. What happened is that slowly but surely over time, perhaps the church shifted around him. He's been very stable in what he's taught and what he's thought. And he's expressed these things over the years. He's given us a very solid body of some of the best theology that was written in the 20th century. And I think the, uh, the Reverend Cardinals there, understanding what a, a solid teacher he was, and being able to present a continuity with the Second Vatican Council and also with the pontificate of John Paul II. They have made a powerful uh, and unified choice demonstrating what they also believe we should be doing as we move farther into this third millennium but, Christian experience. But Greg Burke, I think it's only fair to say, honest to say, that there are some elements in the church that uh, will not be pleased with this choice. Oh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Ratzinger was always... Uh, lightning rod and we better get used to calling him Benedict the 16th. Benedict the 16th. <laughs> when, when he was Cardinal Ratzinger and working for John Paul II he was very much a lightning rod and, and took a lot of the hits for Pope John Paul II. He often um, was was perhaps the bad cop to the good cop of John Paul II and uh, maybe that was just his job. His job was holding the line. Uh, you were talking about several of the documents that came out of his congregation in the year 2000. Dominus Jesus saying Christ is the only way to salvation essentially, uh, shocked all sorts of other Christian denominations, uh, uh, non-Catholics, and, and it was it was really very, very strong stuff, but uh, also straight Catholic doctrine. And I think Ratzinger is somebody who knows what he believes, is not afraid to say it. You were also mentioning the Good Friday meditations. It was very interesting that Cardinal Ratzinger somehow got the call this year to write those. Those were normally written by other theologians. They also let the Orthodox, somebody, write them one time or another. Never before had any cardinals done it. This time, it was the last year of the Pope's life. For some reason, John Paul II chose Cardinal Ratzinger to do that. Cardinal Ratzinger obviously stepped up to the plate once more, as we had seen also in recent days, uh, really taking advantage of that to, to state some pretty heavy stuff, as he did there. Uh, I was talking about Good Friday, and so there were reasons for his strong language.